All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Laura Goodrich, who is in Minneapolis. How are you doing, Laura? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. And Laura is an expert on the future of work and technology with over 20 years experience as an executive coach and is recognized by Thinkers360 as one of the top 20 thought leaders in transformation, future of work, change, culture and technology. And Laura is also the founder of GWT Next, which provides a unique process to transform the underlying assumptions of the workforce. OK, and what we're going to talk about today is Remote leadership, remote leadership, great, great title. So Laura, let's let's get straight into it. What, what do you mean by remote leadership? Well, maybe if you'll let me step back a little bit and give some yeah. context as to what, you know, what the impetus was to produce this process and program. Um, when COVID began, it was immediately apparent that organizations were going to put their head down and really plow into business continuity, right? It didn't yep. take didn't take much um, to, to realize that that was going to be vulnerable, particularly, particularly in certain industries. And so people really, and leaders, uh, for good reason, plowed forward to ensure that. Mm. And lo and behold, um, it it worked out fa fairly well and, and to the surprise of many leaders in particular legacy industries that would have denied the possibility of that being successful, it worked. Yeah. Um, and when that was occurring, I thought to myself, I think there's going to be very strong emphasis on this, such a strong emphasis on business continuity that the connecting with their team members and that social and emotional connection that psychic reward that people get from their work and being a part of something bigger than themselves, um, that coupled with the with the isolation would would lend to um, challenges. And what we, you know, what we have always come to recognize is that if there's a lot of uncertainty, changing and innovating is is even more difficult. And mm -hmm. if there's uncertainty, people will become tethered to what they know, even if it's not working, even, even if you've got data upon data upon data that says this, this is problematic. Um, and so I, I, I re realized that it was important to help leaders realize the, that reconstructing that social and emotional health would be critical to and play a critical role in their ability to innovate and change. And that was the impetus of producing that program. Yeah, and, and what's really interesting, um, Laura, is because a lot of people have talked about uh, it from an employee point of view, right? From everybody being you know, virtual or remote or changing structures. and uh, But very few people talk about it from the leadership point of view, because uh, as you're saying, Remember, they're also dis they were also discombobulated by the whole like change. They were also having to adjust work practices, work at home, do whatever it is, and and I think, as I said, I think the focus has been all on the employees, which is fine, and that's that's all and good. But you can't have one without the other. You can't have one without the other, and you know, again, leaders were seeing and realizing the benefits of of, of business working. Um, and so it's natural that they would focus on that and, you know, largely underestimate how much people got in the work environment in terms of psychic reward of, of being together with pals and having, you know, lunch with them and, and talking and collaborating about the challenges that they're facing or the terrible client that they have or the customer that's, you know, those things, you know, largely went away. And um, interestingly enough, we, d we produced this program and then we worked with a data analyst, a Swedish data analyst, and he, he spoke to 5,000 leaders and polled and determined you know, where, they, where they felt there were problems and where they would need help. And he came back to us and said, don't mention the social and emotional health, health um, of leaders and team members alike don't mention it because they think it doesn't matter. They don't mm -hmm. believe it doesn't even register. And I said, well, what, what if it will, or it just hasn't just yet. 
And with if the ramifications of this will be, you know, uncertainty and, you know, maybe exodus from the workplace, right? So a lot of times when people are looking for other opportunities, they don't know why. And it's easy to say, oh my gosh, it's a big, you know, it's a big bump in pay. That's an easy thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, people will seek to fill holes, when there's, sure. you know, when there's holes. And um, I believe that's what we're seeing now is that people are out there trying to get that social and emotional health back. Yeah, and, and I think even, yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think even more so, I think people are starting to reconsider their whole uh, approach to work in terms of like who they want to work for, where they want, where they want to locate themselves. Because the days of, just applying to a big company and then getting a, you know, moving close to that building in a high cost area and, and you're first out the door when things go wrong. I think people are completely changing their whole approach. And I think this is creating quite a challenge for organizations uh, because, uh, you know, as you were pointing out, the future organization is often going to be some people will be in offices, maybe. Some people will be full-time employees. Some people will be remote. They'll be full-time employees. Sometimes they won't. Sometimes they'll be contractors. Sometimes they'll be long-term. They'll be hybrid. They'll be all over the world. There's so many challenges to to uh, building a team and keeping them connected now that you're going to have hybrid organizations. For sure. And we we believe that that's true. And, um, you know, there, there's still some deniers that are, you know, uh, on the tip of their toes, just waiting to call everybody back and, and get back to business as usual. And that's always, an, you know, that's an interesting story. But, you know, when people say that to me, I say, well, you know, your, your next door neighbor, the organization that's right, right next door right now, they're doing a triple summy off of their desks because, they're going to poach your very best people because they're looking at, you know, building flexibility in and really having a consideration. The demographic realities that are co contributing here cannot be de denied. They're just plain and simple, uh, you know, numbers. A lot of boomers have exited the workplace. They didn't have enough gas in the tank that they wanted to lead through this kind of <clears throat> couple of years. So they exited and, you know, Generation X is a lot smaller. You know, we've got some dynamics you can't wish away. Um, they are real and that will continue. So the organizations that figure out how to do what you just described, um, they, they will win. And even in the industries that, you know, there's some industries where people will ha have to be on premises all sure. the time. There, that, that will always be the case. But there are others that you know, have the capacity. In fact, I yesterday spoke with the CEO of an organization that was brought in to do just that in the industry that would more typically always be present. And I mean, he's putting together a strategy and a plan to drive this business and to, you know, to offset the competitors. Yeah. And, and like you said, I mean, I think this is going to affect, um, I think this is going to affect uh, more industries than people think. And even those ones where we we, we used to assume would were essential to be in in the office. I mean, look at telemedicine right now. I mean, the, we, we would, I mean, a couple of years ago, you'd be said, are you mad? I'm not going to visit my doctor online. I need to go see them in person. Um, now they can, they can see you online. And in fact, they don't even have to be in the medical building themselves particularly right, right. right. Um, and so, that opens so, some doors of flexibility and you look at um you know communities rural communities that have forever struggled at bringing in you know medical professionals what that may mean to them and when you say that john it makes me think of someone that said well i took a half a, i had to take a half a day yesterday to go see the doctor half a day vacation walked in and said how how, how, do, how does the surgery feel well fine what do your sutures look like fine well, fantastic. Everything's fine. I just took a half a day for that. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and so there, there are some things that being um, present will be important, but there are plenty that can be, and we're moving into an era where, you know, ongoing monitoring um, and being able to provide data to healthcare professionals that can tell them where we're at and what's going on. That that is there and it's 
advancing even more. So like you said, there are the, the organizations that say we have to do it this way because we've done it this way are, you know, there are others that are like, okay, this is it. This is our inroad. Those that are stuck, you know, this is our chance. There's going to be a nick in their armor and we get to now go in and capitalize on that reality. Yeah, and there's a couple of other things that uh, you mentioned. I wanted to come back to, but uh, one of them is uh, one of them is the is as we said. I mean, companies have to be more broad-minded and more and more innovative right now because I mean, for instance, if you have people who maybe they were forced to go work at home, but then they suddenly reconnected with their family, their kids. They were like bringing their kids to school in the morning or whatever it is, and they decide that this is a much healthier way to live. Uh, I think organizations then need to uh, move more in towards the results oriented, maybe uh, maybe be more flexible uh, with with working arrangements. But I think we have to meet somewhere in the middle. And if you're just trying to force people back into the way it was, I mean, I think you're going to you're going to lose out not just on the person, as you said, they might just decide to move on to someone else. But you're going to lose out on somebody who's a lot, who maybe has a lot of institutional knowledge and experience, but who could be happier and more and contributing more if you were more flexible. Absolutely, I I, I could not agree more. So I mean, when I, my children were young and they're growing, and it's a very different space and time for me. But when they were young, I went to industry and said, I need. I was in medical sales at the time. I said, I need something more flexible. I just can't. And they looked at me like I had eight eyes. You know, like it was, you know, you, the, uh, it wasn't the outcome. It was whether your car was in a spot and whether you were sitting at that desk at wee hours in the morning and still late in the afternoon. Well, here we are now let's fast forward. We've had all these things go on. And as you mentioned, we've got generations of people that are saying, I realized some things and I'm looking for those things. So here's an example that speaks to that. I saw or listened to a podcast with K KPMG and a research company um, out of England are looking at the number of women that exited the workforce during COVID because of the childcare demands. Mm -hmm. um, also, the number of boomers that exited that weren't really interested in being done. They just didn't want to work 12 hour days any longer. And they're doing research on um, four to six hour, working four to six hours. And you know what it makes me think of is I, I had a conversation with a, a, an employee, government employee, and they had some really stringent requirements. You can only apply for this role if you have five years experience. And this employee said, I waited and waited and waited. And then I got the job after waiting that five years and I could accomplish all requirements in a half a day. I mean, it just, it was amazing because she was very technically competent, required a lot of technical um, experience and competency. So think about that, you know, the number of people that are you know, are very fluid in what they do and what they can get done. And I'll tell you what, a young mother is one of <laughs> a very good example of, of someone that can multitask. And there's countless millions of them that exited the workforce and tremendous opportunity for organizations that figure out how to do that. And the other thing they brought into play was shift work. Mm. And it's not like manufacturing required shift work, but just getting the job done shift work. And again, dual working families where they can, you know, they can decrease the time that their children are in daycare and yeah. increase the time that they spend with both parents. Yeah, and, and I honestly think that I, I think a smart organization will figure out how to harness this. And also you mentioned the generational thing. I mean, somebody mentioned to me that there is four uh, touching on five generations in the workforce. It's never happened before. And to your point, Different generations have different kind of, uh, you know, I mean, they're not all completely like demarked, obviously, but um, different different generations have different kind of requirements, different kind of interests and stuff. So if you're having a one size fits all, it's not going to work anymore because, as you said, like the, the millennium or the Gen Z or whatever, um, I, I mean, they're showing now their tenure in a job is like a year and a half, maybe, you know, before they bop off somewhere else. So you've got to realize that either you're going to have to be able to onboard people quickly, get them involved when knowing that they have a shelf life, or you're going to have to adapt 
a little bit to to what they want in order to in order to retain. So th- he- here's a story that I heard recently, and I was like, oh my gosh! So this is an organization that has. Um, a lot of young people, very uh, young salespeople, in fact, and they, you know, if they're if they're producing, of course, they want to keep them around. And so, what they're offering after three years is a th- um, three month sabbatical, fully paid three month sabbatical. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, it's yeah, just yeah. what's the name of that company? I'm, what I'm is the name kidding. of that company? <laughs> no, right? no, I'm, jo- I'm joking. Yeah, I need to get my application in. Right. So, I mean, you know, the things, the things that would never have been a consideration with generations prior, um, you know, are now going to be considered as a leverage point to attract and keep people. And um, those that are stuck with that one size fits all will, you know, will be, will be realizing what happens when that's the case. Mm-hmm. And I think as you, as people, if they shift their, their mindset to, you know, be more results and more outcome oriented and, you know, as, and then to be more flexible about the path by which people get to those results, I think would be, and I think part of the problem is that today it's very easy, as you said, it's very easy to manage people by looking who's here, what time did they come in at your, oh, oh, you know, Laura's working really, really hard because she's here to midnight. Well, you know, Laura's writing her novel over there. I, I didn't know that, but you're certainly in the office, right? So it right. looks to me like you're working really hard. And that and that are my, there's my criteria for who is, who's doing well and who's not, instead of, as I said, shifting it to more results oriented. And that takes a little bit more work. It does take more, more work and it would be um, naive of us to say that that's easy because the, the complexity of work increasing, um, it is much more difficult to put your finger on those outcomes. I mean, you speak very, uh, you know, to a sales uh, group and organization. Well, it's easier to put measurables around that. That's always been easy to measure outcomes, but there's a lot of industries and a lot of roles that, you know, that the work is ongoing and it's extremely complex and very difficult to put your finger on the pulse of that. So that's easier said than done. But the bottom line is that the, there will be people that are figuring it out. Mm-hmm. And there will be leaders and organizations that figure it out and others that will say, I'm sorry, that's, you know, we don't do it that way. You know, let's go back to the way it was. Yeah. And it's interesting what you said at the at the beginning, though, because I think uh, there's there's obviously people who will self select out of this, you know, would say, okay, maybe I'm at a stage of my career, maybe I don't even want to be a leader anymore, maybe I want to retire, maybe I want to do something else, because all of this um, looks too difficult. So that creates um, both an opportunity and a vacuum in some ways. Mm-hmm. It does. And, you know, it uh, about 15 years ago, I spoke with a um, senior leader in an organization, and they had a very special type of engineering expertise. And when people would retire, it was very difficult for them. And so he got creative. And I just remember him telling me the story. He went to one engineer. He said, what would be perfect for you? He said, well, I'd like to select a project to work on. I'd like to work on it long enough that I make $30,000. And at that point, I'd like to go spend that $30,000 on a fantastic trip. Then I'll come back and I'll repeat the process. Could you help me do that? And he said, actually, I think we can. Mm -hmm. And another one said, well, my preference would be to work mornings. I'm a morning person. I'd like to work till noon. And then I will, you know, just sort of um, just work half days. So, I mean, again, this becomes complex, particularly with um, not, you know, compensation is is the least of, of, of Mm -hmm. the hard parts of this. I mean, certainly insurance and all those things become complex. But the second that someone says it's impossible to do, there's someone out there that's saying, well, watch me, you know, yeah. or someone else that's listening very carefully and saying, maybe I could create a company that would help solve that challenge with all of these people, all of these organizations needing to have this flexible workforce that include all the things you brought up a few minutes ago. Yeah, no, I, 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 I totally agree. And, and as you said at the beginning, it's a two way street, like I can't expect to just make a load of demands on an organization and say, here's my wish list. And this is how I'm going to work and you're going to support me or not. Um, I think you also <clears throat> it also requires on the behalf of the employee say, OK, I'm looking for these things. How can I 
present and reassure the organization that this is going to be a good thing for them. It is. Absolutely. And I, again, I just keep hearing all of these terrific stories. I just heard it, you know, the, the young professionals that have proven themselves and, and have demonstrated um, that they can drive outcomes. Uh, they are now getting some very, very nice offers. Um, very, you know, and I, I love seeing it because they're being rewarded for that. And um, so that, you know, I, I've done generational, I've focused on generations for many, many years and all of the years speaking so disparagingly about the, the younger generations. And I'm like, you know, I just have to tell you, I mean, at some point they're going to, they're going to move into the fast lane and we, we will, we, we already do need them desperately. And they have skills and insight that the future needs. So, you know, we'll be looking cross uh, with cross eyes at them until some point where we recognize they are the way, you know, they, they are going to, you know, bring us forward. And thank goodness, you know, that some things change. When new generations come into play, they force some things. The medical industry, if you look at how mm. physicians worked, right? And when they went through residencies at one point, it was inhumane the hours that they had to work. I don't know how I don't know how they treated patients and had them come out alive at the end of what they had to do. But then, you know, a younger generation came in and said, that's not working. We've got dual working families. We, you know, we, we need to care for our, our, our children. And so those new generations forced some shifts in models. And, and sometimes those models need to be shifted. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that's why, you know, the, your your um, remote leadership is a uh, leadership, sorry, is is a great idea, because I do think that people need a lot of help. The traditional like leadership training and, and books and all that, it's all great, great information in there. There's great enduring, um, there's great enduring lessons in a lot of these things, but the world has changed and you need to change with it and you need to have the the wherewithal to do that. So just um, just quickly before we go, please do describe what your remote leadership process is like. Well, we, you know, I believe that change is a process. It's not an event. And so it hit me, even though I've done a lot of training, John, it hit me that a stand alone training yields yep. very little outcome. And so we are committed to designing processes that take place over the course of 90 days that, you know, break that learning into smaller bite-sized pieces that include coaching and cohort groups and working together with peers linking arms and, and going through a process together, storytelling as a me means by which to deepen that process. So all of our programs are built on that, uh, you know, over the course of time, not a, you know, not a here's your little afternoon and go mm -hmm. back and do what you used to do. Um, remote leadership is follows that 90 day process, begins with reconstructing the social and emotional health. And the second half of it is a thinking process to come up with innovative solutions to the challenges being faced um, of leaders. So that yeah. is what that program is about. Yeah, it's fantastic. And I would encourage people to go check it out. Uh, GWT next, N-E-X-T dot com. It'll all be, by the way, all of Laura's information is going to be below the video and links to the site. But I would I would seriously uh, encourage people to check it out. I think I think if you're sitting in that position where you're thinking, OK, COVID's nearly over, everything is kind of going to go back to normal. And now, you know, you need to kind of check yourself because things ain't going back exactly the way they were. And now you need to equip yourself for what the future holds. Right, Laura? Absolutely. It's great. It's a time of peril, but it's also a time of great opportunity. And not every organization, not every group is going to realize that. But for those that do, um, I think there'll be great opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, thanks again, Laura. Thank you all for watching and listening. As I said, all, all of Laura's information will be below this video. So please go check it out. And I will see you all again really soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, John. Thank you, everyone.